told me uh, told me a year ago. So, uh, as Matt said, my name is uh, Josh Lightgard. I'm the co-founder of Kickoff Labs. Uh, we sell simply amazing landing pages and campaign tools for marketing teams. Um, before starting Kickoff Labs, I mostly led engineering teams, uh, first at Microsoft and then at a company called Telligent that sold um, social collaboration software to the Fortune 500. Uh, so I knew a lot about building products, but almost nothing about selling and marketing products. Um, so that's a little bit about me, but I want to know about people in the audience, just so I have a sense and you know, people can chat, ask me questions you know, during and after. But um, so how many people here, I'm assuming you're all sort of in the startup space or thinking about it, so I won't ask that question, but the next question is, how many people here have zero customers today for their startup? Hands up. Okay. Over, over 50. Got one, two, three, four. Okay. Over, uh, over 500. Wow. All right. <laughs> Are you over a thousand? Sweet. What are you doing here? <laughs> you you come up and, and and stand here and teach with me. How many paying customers? Yeah. Yeah. So so we are. Uh, I, I should cover. We are a. Uh, we are a for paying, for profit, bootstrapped company. Um, but I think the advice that I'm gonna give here is just generally uh, generally applicable whether you're a VC, everybody needs customers, everybody wants more customers, everybody wants to go viral, whatever that is. Um, and, uh, and I think there's some practical tips and some advice that we, you know, we've learned the last, uh, last couple of years to help everybody get there. Um, so like I said, uh, we launched last June. Uh, my co-founder and I, we started developing the software in February. We're both product people. We spent February to June. Uh, we took our own advice. We put up a landing page. It was awesome, um, and uh, and we had this landing page, and we were you know we thought we were doing a decent job getting people uh, getting people to come to it. Um, and when we launched the product last June, um, at the end of the month, we made ten dollars, and that's not profit. That was literally we took in ten dollars of cash. So I I talked to Scott. And I said, Scott. This is been a month, what are you going to do with your five dollars? <laughs> and he said, hookers and blow. <laughs> and I said, you're going to have to lower your standards or we're going to have to, uh, we're going to, have to uh, get better at customer acquisition. Um, and so over the, next, uh, over the next year since then, uh, we passed uh, 7,000 customers last week and about 15 to 20 percent, depending upon the month, depending upon the source of those customers, end up paying us at some point um, for the use of our product. And so. Um, I say it's still an education in progress uh, for us, but I think I can. I wanted to take what we did in a year. Uh, I did an interview on Mixergy, and I said, well, this was really fun. I want to teach more people what I did. So I put this, I talked to Matt, and, uh, and we put this together. Um, so, like, like it says, I'm here to help you get 989 customers. Um, and I break it up into chunks 0 to 20, 20 to 50. So don't worry, there's not 989 of these slides. Uh, to go, or else we'd be here for a long time. Um, but I think it's important to think about it in chunks because when we first launched after that June, if somebody had told me your goal is to get a thousand customers, even a thousand just seemed like this astronomically high number that I was never going to get to. And so focusing on, okay, let's get to 10, <laughs> let's get to 20, let's get to 50, and, and focusing on those goals was sort of the most important thing. Um, this is the uh, introspective sort of view of it. Um, I think your first customer is always you, and I don't mean that in the sense that you know you're the, you're building a product for yourself. Sometimes you are, sometimes you're not. Um, but if you're building a product, uh, if you're building a product, it has to serve you in some way. You're, you're doing it to fulfill a dream. You're doing it to pay for food for your kids. You're doing it for some reason. The product has to serve you. You have to um, you have to love. Uh, you have to love the challenges. Be selfish. You know, love the love the challenges you put in front of yourself. And if you don't love what you're doing, and you're going to be doing it for you know every day, even if your workday is only eight hours, and as a startup it's not, but even if it was only eight hours a day, that's a lot of time not to not to like you're doing. And your customers will be able to tell if you're not enjoying it. And that's the most important thing. If you take nothing away from this talk, is to love love what you're doing, and that's the cheesy part. But that that's got to show through to your customers because you have to care about them, and that's the and, and if you care about your customers, then they will get you more customers because customers are the key to more customers. 
um, if that makes sense. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, so the first thing we learned after June uh, was that maybe we should have spent some more time outside of the office um, to get that first, uh, the first 10, 10 to 20 customers. Um, the original idea uh, for Kickoff Labs is we thought we'd have the service where companies uh, were, were micro businesses, people that today go and post to Craigslist and say, I, I'm a dog walker. We knew that they needed customer connection tools like an email newsletter and a simple web page. We thought <coughs> we could just get into that space and just get thousands and thousands of them to sign up for the sign up for the service. And so, I, you know, around the time we launched, I started. I said, well, okay, maybe I should have gone outside sooner. I actually started calling dog walkers on Craigslist, and I said you don't have a website, maybe you should have a website. Did you ever think about that? Oh yeah, I have dogs, don't worry. Um, yeah, they need to be walked. Um, and what I found was that, you know, those weren't the right, that wasn't the right target market for us because whether it's just timing for them or whatever, they had this perception, say, oh yeah, I need a website. It's gotta be this big WordPress site with a flash widget and a blog on it. And it's gotta have a Facebook page connection to it. And they, they had this preconceived notion of what they wanted and what, I, what we were trying to sell wasn't it, even if I thought what we did was, a, was, a, was, a, was the right thing for them. Uh, last month I was so proud because finally a dog walker signed yes. up for our service. <laughs> I won my target market last month. I got one person um, to sign up as a dog walker. I was so thrilled. My co-founder just laughs at me. It's, you're crazy. Um, the, the other important thing about going outside the office is, uh, people ask me what this slide means, but um, avoid your direct personal network in terms of pitching and asking for advice. These people are way too kind to tell you that your idea sucks and that your pitch is wrong. Um, they just, there's no, there's no sense in it. And so you know, I started going to startup events and talking to people. And as I was, even as you can hear yourself as you talk through your idea, you know whether or not it's, it's going over well with the other people. And whether or not you're seeking investment money, the best people that we, some of the best people we talked to were angel investors and investors. And I wasn't after their money. I generally wanted to hear their feedback about what we were building. And these people, because they're in the business of giving people money, not that they make the right decisions, because they all told us we were, we were crazy for doing kickoff labs. Um, but the things that they brought up about why they said they were crazy were all right, whether I believe them or not at the time, over the next six months to a year, the holes that they shot in our story all prove to be in some le at some level true. Um, so you know whether you care about investing money or not. You know we we applied to TechStars. We went through the interview process. I talked to Chris Devore. I talked to Andy Sack. There's lots of people in the in the area like that that you can you can find at an event, and you only need to talk to them for five minutes, and they'll give you three things that stink about your idea um, and what you're doing. And as you're meeting these people, um, it's also partially marketing for your product as well because. Um, even if you've got a prototype or you've just got an idea. Um, I know one of the members of uh, the Eastside Incubators has been going to Starbucks and having people fill out surveys. I think it's a great idea. About um, a few months ago, I went to a Starbucks and there was a guy sitting there with a sticker on his laptop that said, he had an iPad, and he said, test my app, get a free coffee. I couldn't resist. I was like, free coffee? I'll test your app. And as I was testing his app and, and giving him some feedback, I realized not only was this something I should have been doing and, and should do more of, but he was he was marketing the product as well, and he was getting feedback and marketing, and so I signed up, I downloaded, I bought the app, you know, and so it was, it was, it sort of served two needs at once for him to go and, and sit there, and, and what did it cost him? He sat there all day, maybe he spent $100, but he had a line of people waiting to try his app at the table, just with the little sign, it was nothing where he could stick on, like, this big, it said, test my app, and he was just working if there wasn't a line um, there while he was at Starbucks, and I just thought that was a great idea, and I wished I'd thought of it. Um, the self-serving part of the talk, um, have a place to send people to if you don't have a product yet. Do you have a potential site where we can go for that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I won't get into the reasons why and, and really pitch the product. I will just say that I don't care who you use for a landing page. There's really two things that people do wrong on these landing pages when, pe when people launch. Is the first one is that they don't provide any incentive for a sign-up and any incentive for a share. They just say, you know, one line about what they're doing and... The line isn't really even that descriptive. And unless you're Apple, unless you're Steve Jobs, unless you already have an audience, that line does nothing. You have to actually sell a little bit on the page, explain what you're doing, explain what the value proposition is for people, and explain why they should sign up and why they should get their friends to sign up when you don't even have a product yet. Um, and so people forget about those two levels of incentives. And the other mistake that people make now watching our customers do this for, for a year 
is that they don't take advantage of the list and, and, and keep themselves in the top of the minds of the customers they signed up. So you know, if you sign up 500, 1,000 names beforehand, but you don't launch for six months, you can help those customers solve their problems over the course of the six months. So one of our customers does a great job there do, building an app to help families find activities for what to do. And every other week he sends out a newsletter says, hey, I know a lot of you are from you know, the Northwest and you know, what you should be doing this weekend with your kids is probably these things. It's not to do with his app, he just manually curates it, but it's educating the customer. that This is what this app is gonna do for you and it's, give, and it's keeping him in the top of the mind so that when he launches or, or goes out, out, to, out to market, people know what they're gonna get out of the product. They know what they should expect to get from the product. And, and that's much more, much better than launching and people saying, well, what, what is this again? And you send them a newsletter and they have no idea what's going on. We wasted so much time on our blog, on our Twitter account, on Facebook. All of these things are a complete fail when you're less than, less than 100 customers. And the reason is, Nobody cares who you are. You have no audience. You've got nothing built up. And this isn't to say that a blog isn't a good content strategy and you shouldn't, shouldn't be building SEO on your blog, but to expect that you're gonna get you know, your first thousand customers from your blog, probably only about 100 of our first thousand came from our blog, and those were towards the very end of getting to the, uh, getting to the thousand mark, where we started to build up a little bit of an audience and had people retweeting and telling the stories that we were, uh, that we were telling on, on, the, on the blog. It, it's just, a, you can't focus on you, you have no audience. So you have to go where the audience is and get yourself a podium on that audience. Um, so I would say customer convention, it could be an actual customer convention that you go to um, and talk to customers. Um, in our case, we sought out, hey, we sought out two markets. We, we sought out the startup space on popular VC blogs, on blogs like TechCrunch, and we didn't pitch to the writers because they get thousands of pitches, but we went into the comments and just started commenting, putting our name out there in comments. Um, we, went to, uh, we went to the sites, uh, sites like inbound.org, which is a great marketing uh, resource site, and started participating in the discussions there. And you, just, you start to participate in those discussions, you start to build a name for yourself there, people click on your profile, they click, through to your, they click through to your service. You have to go where the audience is and start building a reputation there so you can start funneling them back and filling out your own audience. Um, which is really, it's really boils down to finding, uh, finding, finding your niche. So I was, talking to, um, I was talking to the folks from, uh, I, I wanna say talk to the man, but it's talk to the manager um, back there beforehand. And, and, uh, and we had a similar customer then where they were targeting the restaurant service industry, and, he's, and he said, oh, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter. I'm on, I said, no, 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 where do you go? Like, how do you read your, your, your news? He's like, oh, there's this great forum site for restaurant owners that I go and I chat with other restaurant owners there about. I said, so why aren't you telling them what you're doing? He's like, you think I should post there? Yes! Go to those places where they're the niche of the customer that you're, you have, and post there and ask people what they think, ask for feedback, go participate in the discussions if you're not already. Um, and he already had a reputation there as one of the top posters, but he wasn't using it for his, for his startup. And that's just insane not to, not to do that. Um, I say uh, corner influencers, there's a rather scary looking picture of somebody <laughs> cornering an influencer. Um, the stick figures are all mine, the copyright. Um, can we use them though? Yeah, you can reuse them. But uh, the uh, what we did was we just started looking at following Twitter, you know, the Twitter community for those niches of landing pages, marketing, startups, and started looking at people who had high follower counts and just started engaging them in conversations along the way and just got ourselves in. They're not spamming, not you know, iPad. Do you want to buy an iPad? But if we saw them talking about hey, this is a neat landing page, then we would just join that conversation and say, here's what I like about it. Um, and then they'd see us on Twitter and they'd go back through um, and they'd follow through to our profile. Yes, Matt. So uh, are, if you don't talk about this later, are you gonna talk about how you got the KISS metrics conversation going? Um, how I got the KISS metrics conversation going. Um, I, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. All right. Um, but, um, it, it got to the point where we even just built a tool that said, you know, we instead of replying to everybody, we just replied to the top people who were influential on Twitter, and they started mentioning us. They started telling other people about us, and that's again 
using someone else's audience to your advantage. Uh, Quora is for a lot of you might be a good good resource for us. It was 20% of our first thousand customers because we do measure this stuff. Um, finding questions to answer, a, you know, asking your own questions, answering questions, and they have a nifty little promote feature which works way better than I ever thought it would. If you earn some karma, you answer questions, and there's an option that says promote this to, and there's a slider. Just slide it all the way over to the right and say promote your best answers. Um, and it will drive traffic to your site and, uh, and doesn't cost anything but just participating in the community. So we participate in the landing page community, participate in the marketing community uh, online in Quora. And it was, like I said, 20% of our first thousand customers came from, uh, came from that source. And the thing that other people think that people avoid about Quora is they say, oh, somebody answered this question. I'm not going to answer. Mm, those are the best questions to add your two cents to it because there's already 400 people following that question. They'll all get an email notification that says so-and-so also answered this question, here's their two cents. It's not to be spammy and say, use Kickoff Labs, it's the best tool ever, but to say, yeah, in our experience, here's what works for our customers, here's what we've seen work, um, and, to help, uh, and, and to help out, and, and, uh, and people will follow through and click through uh, your site. And then, yeah, there are times where people say, hey, what's the best landing page service out there? There's probably 10 or 20 of those questions on Quora that are really popular, and having a really good answer with an image or so that you put up there is, is incredibly helpful. This is, the, uh, this is the other one. I really wish we'd known about this. So um, customers also bought. Um, I'm going to assume that none of you are shipping this complete product that solves all of your customers' needs in, in one box. Um, customers are you know, piecing together solutions more than ever today, and there's complementary solutions to your solution out there for customers. And so doing some research, not just on who your competitors are, but what are complementary products? What other products are your customers using? Reach out to those people. So to uh, Matt's point, uh, we found out a lot of our, our, our first uh, customers were using, uh, were using, KISS, uh, were using uh, KISS metrics. It was no shocker, we were using KISS metrics too to measure things. And so I just reached out to, to, um, to, to Neil Patel and said, hey, you know, it seems like our, our products are pretty complimentary. Do you mind if I you know, send you a guest blog post that you guys can put up, uh, can put up on your site about you know, how to measure your way to startup success? And, um, and he oh, sounds like an awesome post. Just send it over to you know so and so who runs our blog and and got it up there. And that even though they have lower readership than you know TechCrunch or everything, the conversion rate from those other sources is incredibly high compared to uh, compared to you know Hacker News or all these other places where nobody buys anything. Here on Kiss Metrics blog, it's pre-selected as an audience that already said, I want to buy something. Right? And so for us, when we were selling something, those customers are already sort of pre-qualified that they're going to buy something, and we know they're already interested in piecing together solutions. So we went out and I contacted the, the user voice guys, because we were using user voice and we love the service, and said, hey, can we do a guest blog post about customer support at startups? And they said, sure, right? they're hungry for content just like everybody else is. These are great places, other corporate blogs or, or company blogs are great places to do guest blog posts at. Um, they gave us this awesome T-shirt. I wish I'd thought of it, um, and uh, it's been it's been really helpful. Probably another 20, 20, 25 percent of our customers come from these other you know customers also bought locations or other places where customers are related. That they hung out. Where it's not a competitive situation. It's just the products are complementary. Jasmine. So what's your conversion rate? What's our conversion rate? Yeah. You mean it all the way through to the end, from the top of our cycle to the end? From KISS metrics, you said. Oh, okay. Oh, so, so you're saying just from KISS metrics, the percentage of those customers that converted. Um, the people that actually click through on our site, which are the only ones we can really track, I don't know, I didn't have metrics into what their readership was. Um, it was about 15 to 20% of the people that clicked through didn't just sign up, they also bought, which is an incredibly okay. high number of people that clicked through to, that, that bought the product. Um, you know, if the average number of you know all the way through the funnel is you know two or three percent, then that number is in, uh, is a really good source. And I talk about that in measurement at the end. I love the I love my stick figure on this one. Um, <laughs> let it sink in for a second. Um, steal your customers. Um, this is a little bit controversial because you know we're startups. We're supposed to all be friendly to each other, um, but this is something where. You know, I see other companies do effectively all the time. You know, Box.net, they steal, they're trying to steal from SharePoint. They do huge billboards that say, here's why SharePoint stinks and you should use us instead of, in, instead of SharePoint. That's not out of your realm of possibility to do, it, to do as a startup. So 
Um, and when I say this, I mean you should know A, who your competition is, you should know what you think is their weak points, but then you should chat up their customers and say, hey, I saw you mentioned you know, a tweet about this other service. You know, what, what do you like about their service? Find out what customers actually like about the other service, and then when they notice that you're from a competitor, they'll say, you know what I wish this service did? And you can start finding those things that differentiate you in the minds of your competitor's customers, that differentiate you and your service, because regardless of how upfront you want to be about it, you will be compared to another service or another set of services out there. Um, I was recently looking for, uh, we were looking to upgrade from Google Voice to a better voicemail solution for our customer support. And, uh, and I searched, I knew Grasshopper was one, so I, I always go and I say, Grasshopper competitor. They own the first five links for Grasshopper competitor because they put up a page that says, Grasshopper competitor, and then they compare it to eVoice, compare it to Google Voice, compare it to custom PBS. They own all of that stuff in the SEO space, and you're like, wow, maybe I should just go with Grasshopper. They own the top five links of Grasshopper competitor on, on, on Google, but they're smart because they know that people are going to ask the question regardless, so they might as well be upfront about here's the pros and here's the cons. Now, I think their pages are probably weighted a bit, um, but that's you know in your best interest <laughs> uh, to figure out how you, how you weight pages. Um, and the other thing that you can learn from your competition is where they're searching for an audience. So where are they advertising? Where are they posting online? Where are their marketing people participating? Because that just gives you a heads up. There, you know, if, if you're new to the marketplace, as I think a lot of people are in this room, you have a competitor that's already out there, that's already advertising, that's already getting customers. Why not learn from what they're doing and so you can start up um, at least where they are, if not ahead of them. Um, so it, 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 should be, uh, it should be obvious from my shirt and everything that I, I do think one of the biggest strategies um, to getting customers is actually loving the customers that you have. Your existing customers, like I said, are your key to new customers. Um, the, uh, the, thing of, the, the, the thing about, the, I, I should have led with this, but the reality is it's real easy to love every customer when you've got zero to 20. When you start scaling, say from 100 to 500, it starts to come on you say, oh, do I have to over deliver for this customer too? Do I have to? And I think it's really important to keep that up at that scale because these people are gonna be your first brand advocates out there. Um, and so this is where you can really leverage your size. You can do things um, that you know, bigger guys can't do um, from time to time. This, everything in this section sort of talks about how you can mm -hmm. leverage your size and take advantage of the fact that you're small. You know, customers making sure your support email says from the CEO, I get, replies back, I said, wow, the CEO answered my question. Never mind the two of us. Uh, <laughs> at, at the, but customers are impressed by that, and they, they think that's, uh, they, they think that's you know, something, uh, something that's important. Um, get personal with your customers. Um, I personally emailed uh, the first 1,000 people that built a landing page with Kickoff Labs. And when I say personally emailed, I don't mean that I sent them an auto response for my Google thing, or I copied a mail and sent it 30 times. I looked at what they did in our service. I looked them up in KISS metrics. I looked at what they'd done uh, with Kickoff Labs. I knew about their business. I Googled them and I said, hey, you know, it looks like you're doing this. I'd give them some advice. You might want to try this copy. You might want to try, you know, advertising your page in this location. You might want to do this. So I, I was writing a real personal mail to them. And in return, I said, hey, can you give us some advice? Or can you, you know, if you, if you, you know, if you don't have advice for us, could you share? Um, you know, kick off loud with a few people, and you'll be amazed at the response from that. And if I had to do it again, I would, I would keep, I would, I would absolutely do this again. It took a lot of time, but the reality is, I learned a ton about our market. Uh, I still do it today. I just can't email every single customer to that degree that, that does it, but I pick the best um, and still do it to the same volume for me personally. Because if I had to choose between talking to a customer and learning about them, or building something else for the product, I'll choose learning more about a customer every day. Um, than adding stuff to the product because features are worthless, but customers and making them happy is, is where you'll succeed. As a, as a small tip, I just want to implore anybody starting a company never to use a no reply email address. I hate it. I can't stand it. If you use it, I will not use your product. I just feel like you're saying to the customer, I can send you an automated email, but don't ever reply to this. You should click through to our support page and then file a ticket in the official way. It's so easy nowadays to make sure every email that goes into your, in, in your, at, to, at, at your company goes to a support ticket and funnel it all in. There's no reason to use a no reply 
uh, a no reply email address in today's market. So just don't do it. <laughs> um, I, I think you get the sense I'm a big fan of uh, over delivering for our customers, so you know exceeding their expectations. Um, because, like I said, technology will be copied, and if you're in a successful business, there are five other people at least doing what you're what you're doing. Um, but when a customer emails us, if they have a bug, I give them a free month. If they're reporting something that's a, that's 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 an issue. Um, you know, whether or not we fix it, I, I don't care. We don't say we do that, but I just do it, and most people don't expect it, and they're thrilled about it. And you know, I already the, the amount of time it took me to reply to them and fix the bug, it already cost me that money. So I might as well just give them the free month if you value your time to any degree. Um, when customers ask us, you know, how do I make this change on the page? I'll frequently just go in and, and do it for them really quickly because I can do it like this, and I know it takes them, you know, a half hour of their time to do it. But I'll, I'll send them the the, the instructions say, hey, next time you want to make a change like this, here's the link to our help documentation. But I just went ahead and did it for you, so have a great day. And you know, you hear, you get responses like that as a customer. Imagine how that feels to you as a customer, and then. Those customers will then tell you know their friends about you, which is the goal of you know, being viral and without hacking Facebook. Um, I'm a big believer in sharing your goals uh, with your customers. So we started at 500, and we said we put up a page and said, "Help us get to 500." We put up a personal note on the page with our signatures, and we said, "You know, our goal is to get to 500. When we get to 500, we'll feel like and we put why it was our goal. We'll feel like we've proven that people are interested in this kind of product." Um, and, and it'll validate you know, some of the decisions we've made um, in, our, in, our, uh, in our lives the last, uh, the last couple of months. Um, and I was just honest about why we wanted to hit 500 as our first goal. People like being part of a movement. They don't like being a number, but they like feeling like they're part of something. And I feel like um, there's a lot more we could do with this. We just put the bar graph and said, help us get to 500. Um, but when we hit the number, I had people, with, before I even sent a blog post or newsletter about people emailed and said, hey, I saw on the dashboard that you guys hit 500 customers, congratulations. People were emailing us to say thank you, and they said, did you know I referred five people? I said, yeah, I measure that stuff. Um, <laughs> thank you, here's a free month. Um, and uh, and it's, just, it's just incredibly powerful. When I worked for uh, Microsoft, I worked in developer communities, and we had these people who would answer 200 questions in a month. Um, and you'd talk to them, you say, why in the world are you helping Microsoft answer 200 questions in a month? And the answer is, well, I don't view that I'm helping Microsoft. I view it that I want to work with smarter coworkers, and this is my way of making everyone around me smarter. So to him, it was a movement. He was trying to educate people, educate other developers to do smarter things, to use best practices. And there's a lot, there's power in that. There's emotion in that that you can tap into for your customers. I have no shame. I put a picture of my kids on the on the website on that on that goal, and I said, you know, this is what I'm choosing as my business, and uh, and you know, this kid likes to eat three times a week, and his mom wants to feed him organic food, um, and so you've got to help out, um, or else he might starve, and that would be tragic. Um, you know, at a certain point, this is like leveraging your size. If you're Microsoft, you can't say, man, look at Steve Ballmer's kids; they're skinny. Can, can you feed them? Uh, but you can do that when you're when you're small. Stand out. Um, everybody read, has read uh, or should have read, you know, the, the Purple Cow. Uh, it's it's a great book. This is the Purple Stick guy. Um, who I saw one of these random Twitter conversations between two journalists that get, I'd already written and said, "Can you do a story about us? Here's our pitch." They just ignored two or three of those. I saw them chatting with each other on uh, on, on on Twitter about the. The bubble and they said oh for all you know pets to pets.com 2 is coming back so i set up a landing page and got the domain pets 2 took me you know three minutes to do and and put it up and i said i'll sell it to you guys for two million dollars um and they saw the landing page they saw the humor they saw the sponsored by um and we got two 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 article two both of the reporters wrote about us in in uh in the next web and then uh, and then mentioned us in a magazine on on ink um and be, all because we just we did something crazy to stand out. Maybe if you work at Microsoft, you can't afford to do something crazy like that and just throw something up on the internet and hope that uh, hope that these reporters catch on. You probably don't have to, but um, but it'd be a lot harder to do it um, in, in that case. But because it's just you or you and a couple people, you can afford to be crazy. Um, so. When I get to, uh, I, I do this talk, and people say, with all your focus on customer support, you can't possibly um, scale that. And I say, you're right. I can't, I can't scale that. What I can do, though, is I can 
provide a way to amplify um, the voices of the customers that I have already. Um, and I can make that voice be louder um, than my own voice uh, in the marketplace. And so um, I wrote case studies, quotes, and karma, and I highlighted ask as you go through uh, the letters there. Because it's pretty rare that a customer will actually email you and say, I had a really successful time with your product. I got you know, 10,000 leads because I used, I used your service. Here's how I did it. Here's how I recommend other people do it. They just don't send you those kind of emails. They might send you, say, hey, thanks. I got you know, 1,000 people. Your product was great. Um, but if you start asking for stuff, you'll start getting it because you treated the customers nice uh, to begin with. And so you know, we've got eight case studies up on our sites. And all of them are because I asked the customer. I said, hey, it looks like you guys are being pretty successful. Do you feel that way? And they said, yeah, we love the product. And I said, could you help us out and you know, maybe help us you know, interview, I can interview you and put up a case study with some quotes. Um, and everyone said yes to that, to that question. Um, and you just have to ask the customers more. A lot of people forget that. They'll put a, a like button up on your page. They like us on Facebook. And that's just the worst way to ask possible. Um, I answer a lot of our support emails and I say, when they say thanks, I said, don't thank me. If you want to thank us, go tell five or 500 more of your friends about our service. That's the way that you thank us because most of our, most of our customers, 35 to 40% of our customers come from referrals from other customers. And so that is how you thank us. And so that's asking for karma. You can't just expect karma to hit you. You have to beat it over the head and remind them that, uh, that they owe you something in some cases. Um, always be selling is I think the classic way of saying this. There are really two points on this slide. Um, we got, a, a, of the thousand, first thousand customers we had, we got about mm, 18 or so percent um, from doing a deal on AppSumo. Um, once you get past a couple hundred, you've proven market success. The services that do daily deal sites will talk to you. You can negotiate with them. Um, it was useful for us just to get our name out there and traffic didn't drop off afterwards. It's just another you know, quick way to go it if you're a for sale product, not looking for, for free. The other thing to do is never stop selling your existing customers. And so um, I see people that do, do really well all the time saying, you know, hey, you know, because of our service, did you know that, uh, that uh, you see like LinkedIn will do it in their email, say so-and-so connected. I don't think those are the best. Uh, but because of our service, you got 10,000 leads. That's really awesome. Um, and you, I'm selling to an existing customer because, A, I want them to stay as, a, as an existing customer. So I want them to realize the value they're getting out of the service. Um, but just also because that also is just another chance to be in their heads and they might be in a conversation talking to their friends saying, yeah, you know, I got, I crossed 5,000, you know, leads today generated from Kickoff Labs. And I said, what's Kickoff Labs? And I have another customer. Um, we're a freemium product. I could talk a lot about that. I'll take questions. Um, and so I, I look for, uh, I like people that use the cheap creatively. There's no end to people who don't care how crappy their experience is if they get it for free. Um, I didn't at first think I wanted to take advantage of these people, but they're like a zombie horde. They will always ask for it. And so if you can figure out a way to balance making sure that those people don't suck away my time because I want to provide a high level of support to paying customers, um, then they absolutely are a big source. Right now they're, um, you know, they're probably about um, another 20% of our product, uh, of our sales come from people who just, you know, they want the free version of our product. They're never going to pay for anything, but hey, if they want to build up a, you know, huge audience and put our logo there front and center as logo wear. That's great. Um, one local company I think did this really well was Simply Measured. Um, they have, they, it wasn't their product, but they said, hey, you know, if you want to get your first report, you have to tweet our service. And you can think that's spammy, but hey, it, it costs them something to generate the report. It costs them to talk to you. Um, they just asked for a tweet and they said, here's your first report for free from, uh, from Simply Measured. Figure, it didn't cost them much from the support perspective either. So figure out ways, in, in, intelligent ways, if you're a for pay product, you can leverage the free, the zombie horde out there of free people. Um, and you, you think I'd measure this first and say, uh, I, I, you think I'd mention this first and say you should, uh, you should measure um, and keep measuring. Um, but the reality is, I know a lot of people start spending a lot, of, spinning their wheels on measuring. Uh, way too early. A lot of our customers will email me and say, hey, you know, what do you think the best A-B test for this page would be? And I'll go look at their page and I'll say, you had 10 views last month. Before you start talking about A-B testing, get a thousand views. <laughs> you know, get a thousand people looking at it or else the A-B test is meaningless. So we, we started way too early doing the testing and, and the problem with that is 
when you're so early, your traffic isn't consistent, you're not getting consistent people. So when you look at sources, one source can dominate your overall conversion rate in the test, and maybe it wasn't a good source. Maybe they stopped off at the first point um, in the funnel, but you might make a decision based on that because 10 people did it when you really just have to leave a test up. I, I don't leave a test running even you know, at thousands of people hitting our site per, per week. I don't leave a test up less than a, less than a week before I consider I get some sort of usual numbers. Most of the time I leave a test up for, for about three weeks at a time before I feel like I get something that I can actually trust uh, in return from the test. And then the other point about this slide um, is a lot of people just look at your overall conversion rate, but I think it's incredibly important to separate it by source and to know what really works. Because if you think about you know, lean, the lean startup movement about you know, iterating on your product, you have to iterate on your marketing as well to know, hey, you know, this week, this source, we spent a lot of time doing a guest blog post on you know, so-and-so location and nobody converted. Don't, don't post there again. <laughs> You know, but you did another, you did one for, for Kiss Metrics that converted. We're working on another post for the Kiss Metrics site because I know that that'll convert customers because I measured it um, and I know that those people went all the way through the funnel. That's it. Um, I'm here to chat. I can take questions. Um, I'm at Evolving We. You can get tips at blog.kickofflabs.com if you can read my chicken scr scratch. Um, and my co founder and I have also been blogging at a site called uh, WeBootstrap.org. So. That's it, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and I'll take questions. Wow, first of all, <laughs> Any questions? I do have a question, but I don't want to dominate. Does anybody else have a question first? All right, so we, we were talking about pricing and how, uh, how, do you, how do you figure out you know, what the right price was and what to put in premium versus paid and kind of thinking through all those issues. Yeah, and one of, the, one of the mistakes we made is two separate questions there, one about pricing, one about the freemium. On the pricing aspect of, uh, of things, um, we charge way too little at, at the front. Whatever you have in your mind, try and charge twice as much. Um, it's, it's actually easier, I think, to lower prices over time than it is to keep raising them on people, even if you keep the you know, existing people um, there. And so um, our initial pricing was based on what we thought um, what we thought the market would bear, and what we should have based on was what we thought we needed to make per customer to make the service worth doing. Um, so if that gives you a, a bit of advice, uh, let's charge what you think you need to you need to charge to make up for uh, you know to make up for your your your, your costs. Um, not don't go under that at first. Um, and then on the freemium side, um, like I, I kind of alluded to it, um, when we were choosing what would go into fr the free plan versus the paid plan. Uh, we drew a line and said. These features generate support that we want to handle. These features seem like they're hands off for the customer. That's where we drew the line. It had nothing to do with what we thought you know, free versus paid would use more. Um, some, in some cases, you know, we've moved stuff back to free as we've you know, solved the support problems and made it easier. But our goal was, you know, if you're paying us, we don't mind helping you with the more complicated actions um, in setting up a site, like embedding widgets in another site. Something that's more complicated than just putting up a page if you want to use our campaign tools and put widgets in other places. Sometimes that necessitates a support call. It's a little bit more technical. A developer gets involved um, frequently that does the site. And so we said, no, free customers can't use, can't use that widget. We just don't want to handle the support. But you can set up a page um, because that's mostly hands off in our case. So we, we drew that line because we knew we wanted to focus on paying customer support. So did you happen to know which of your features was generating the most value for our customers. I would have imagined that you would have drawn the free versus paid line based on the value you offer to your customers. If it's a very high value feature, you want to put it in the paid bucket versus if it's a low value feature, you want to put it in the free bucket. Yeah, so initially we, we did that and um, maybe we were wimps uh, on, on some of the initial feedback, um, but we got, you know, and we got a lot of hate mail from people saying, um, you know, some of our high value features uh, like the, the auto response and the newsletter stuff like, oh, they, that just should be in the in the in the in the free uh, in the free plan and I don't see why you would charge for that and maybe we were whims and we listened to them um, but that's that's another way to, to go about doing it it works for it works for uh, a lot of companies out there but we also just we felt like we wanted to give people a taste of you know the good stuff the high value stuff we put our logo on it. And so really, anybody who's serious is going to want to remove a logo of somebody else 
um, on their on their product. At least I, that, that's what people tell us. Um, the people that want to pay, and, and so why not just give them access to something if it doesn't cost us much in terms of support and maintenance to do? Why not give them a taste? Eventually, they're going to want to take the logo off anyway because they were so successful because we gave them the higher value tools. It's a good question, though. Any other questions? Yeah, go for it. Uh, so initially, you said that you were targeting, you know, dog walkers on Craigslist. Yeah. And then you figured out what your target market was and what are the places where having those conversations led to people visiting your site. Uh, what are the places that we had the conversations or what? What were the forums, right? You said you went and you did guest, po yep, guest yep. posts. You followed a bunch of people on Twitter and found out what their conversations were and started injecting yourself in those conversations. Yeah, we, we, uh, in the kind of the lean, the, the lean startup say we formed some assumptions first and we said, Okay, so we had formed this assumption that micro, you know, micro uh, businesses would be would be a big customer. As we started talking to them, you know, we said well, micro businesses today live on Craigslist. So we went to Craigslist. We started having the conversations. Proved they weren't our customer. They weren't buying. They didn't like the pitch. Um, and so then we formed another assumption. Said, you know, I'll bet startups would want to use this because you know we did. We didn't use it very effectively, but um, and we started talking to other startups and other new businesses, not just startups, but. Um, going to places like uh, like new business groups and not in a tech focused space. I think a lot of us are in the tech space and get caught up in that tech bubble. But there's people all across the country trying to launch, you know, trying to launch um, uh, new businesses, whether it be a store at a mall, a kiosk, a mail order delivery, something that they're that they're building. Um, and so there's I don't know the specific names, but there's lots of forums like the um, American Express has a great small business forum out there, and so we went and talked to the people in the American Express Small Business Forum um, out there um, and got a lot of feedback from, from those people, and those people came and became, um, became customers, and sort of like avoiding your personal network, avoiding that sort of tech bubble and getting out into those other locations is, is, uh, is critical to help validate the assumptions. Uh, what? Yeah, you. Yeah, great. So, you know, what kind of mix of customers do you have between you're selling on a product website, actual product goods or services. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts around them? How do they behave? That's one question. Number two, is it just in the U.S. or do you have international expansion? <laughs> um, there's two of us. Uh, the product is uh, the product itself is uh, it allows people to create pages and emails that are 100% localizable. So as that was one of the things we heard from when we stole from our competitors. They said, you know, with your competitors, I can't localize these two things and that keeps me from paying them we said fine everything any text you see you can change uh, on the page the email forms the email address and just make it all work um, internationally um, and that actually has been big for us we have a lot of people uh, a lot of people in Brazil a lot of people in Europe that, that use the product because we listened to what some of our competitors couldn't do at the time um, and and gave uh, and gave, gave a leg up to that and the other part of your question was so what kind of mix do you have between services, products, actual physical products, yeah. and digital products? <laughs> um, I will say it's amazing how many people want to be Groupon for X uh, about a year ago, and then amazing how many people want to be Pinterest for X now. Uh, <laughs> but because I, I get I get insights into that. Um, so today, about um, a huge grow, the most growing part of our business is about uh, is twenty percent of our businesses are medium-sized companies that are starting to do more targeted campaigns. Um, like they want to have a, they run a set of Google ads that goes with a campaign to get people to sign up for their newsletter. Um, and agencies that market bands that say, hey, join the band's mailing list. If you refer three friends, we'll give you free tickets to the, to the band site. So that's about 20%, but that's our fastest growing segment of customers. And then of the rest of the 80%, um, it's, I'm gonna guess I don't have the, the numbers, but I, I lump them all into the 80% of the new business people um, today. And of the new business people, it's probably 60% tech startups. That's where we did a lot of our. That is where we did a lot of our initial marketing. And about 40% of that 80% so is now confusing numbers. So 60, 20, whatever that math works out to be, um, under the 80% are people that do services. What? You said 40% of the 80%. Yeah, 40% of the 80%. <laughs> okay. So it's 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 two third two thirds of the eighty percent yeah, uh, I, like I said I don't break it I don't break it down as much as I break it, I separate into those two general buckets of where we're trying to grow our business and where we 
have existing customers, but it's uh, it's about you know two thirds, one third. Um, Jasmine, you had a question. That was my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> What are the future challenges? Uh, our goal bar stands at 25,000 customers. Um, beyond the, uh, beyond um, that kind of vanity metric out there, um, our biggest challenge uh, today being, uh, being two people and bootstrapping is deciding where to reinvest and, and how much of our time, mostly our time, uh, to reinvest. Because we're getting to the point where we can hire contractors and we can bring on people to do, uh, to do some work. But the biggest challenge is figuring out, you know, where we want to grow the, the fastest. So in that space where it's 80% new businesses, there is absolutely a lifespan to those customers for us. In the space where it's 20% of people today doing campaigns, um, the, those people keep reinvesting and repurchasing over time because they run a new campaign, they run a new series of Google AdWords. And so figuring out the right mix of how not to piss off customer A but grow customer B, which sticks with me longer than what customer A sticks with us today for. Does that make sense? Basically balancing our time and then balancing, uh, and balancing our, our new features and releases so we're not alienating the people that got us here, but recognizing a growing market. You mentioned Betterman a lot. What tools do you use for measuring? <laughs> I try a lot. Um, I, I, I do love uh, KISS metrics, as that's the one I go to every week when I look at and I break down our numbers. Um, and even their reports I export to Excel and then, uh, and then do my own pivoting on, on their reports when I export the funnel and want to break it down, like I said, by source. They don't really have a great report for that, so I push it into Excel and, uh, and do that myself. Um, you know, we do the, the standard you know, Google Analytics. Um, and then because we're so support focused, you know, uh, user voice has a good series of stats for, uh, for your customer support to look at what's causing support issues, to look at where you can improve. Um, and I say within, to go back to KISS metrics, I apologize, I talk fast and I jump around, but um, within KISS metrics, there's two different things I look at. There's the funnel, which I mentioned a lot, but then the other thing you, they let you do is just wire up random events um, within your product. So essentially we use them for our product instrumentation as well. So to be able to see, you know, a heat map of, of within our product, these are the activities that people do and to break that out into paying and free customers and even to see because for free customers, we put the first button there so we can see what they're trying to click into and then we have an upgrade screen that says they need it. So we measure, you know, which of those buttons are they pushing to see what makes them upgrade to figure out what, what drives them to upgrade to a, paying, uh, to a paying service so we can work on promoting that more externally on our marketing sites. Did that answer the question? Yes. Any other, anything else? Very cool. Well, um, before we, no, oh, wait. We it looks like we've got so one, one more. The, uh, the tool to analyze support requests. Oh, it just—it's the stuff that's built into to user voice okay. um, as a service. I'm, I'm a big fan of theirs, and, and uh, they're—they've uh, been really helpful for us. Did you test any kind of explanation video to uh, explain to new people how this thing adds value to the business? Um, I, I want to. Um, He's gonna. Be there, be there I, I, I want to. This is my goal to come up with another video as, as part of as part of that. When we launched, we actually had a video on our page, um, and it turned out that the uh, a rotating slideshow of the four features sold better than the video. So the several hours I put into making, you know, a few days putting into making a script and shooting the video myself and doing it, got beaten by like 20 minutes of putting together a, a, a slideshow with some ex explainer text on the homepage. I was so mad and I said, I wrote off videos for at least a year and um, so now I'm going back and I'm going to try a video again and see if I can beat it. <laughs> so great, I just have, before, I just have, was, uh, just so for my own interest, because Matt doesn't do exit surveys or anything, was this useful to people yeah. here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Great. 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 Josh just called me out. I will from now on do uh, do exit surveys. It's actually a great idea. Um, and I did just check startupvideoday.com is live, and it shows I did, built it on Kickoff Labs in about the four minutes before uh, this presentation started. So you can kind of see that product in action. All the errors are mine. All the good stuff's Josh. But thanks again, Josh. That was awesome. He'll be around all night. Cool. Hey, in the, uh, there's plenty of beer left. Josh is going to go drink one now. Uh, hang around.
Uh, thank you all for coming.